How many people here have studied dispensationalism over the years? Are you new to it? You're a professional at it? <laughs> okay. All right. Studied it years ago. Studied it years ago? <laughs> okay. I was saved in a church plant years ago in 1980, and I was introduced to dispensationalism right from the beginning. Six months into being saved, my pastor decided to disciple me and was putting dispensational theology books into my hands right away. So I went to two solidly dispensational Bible colleges and seminaries, and it's been a passion of mine for years. I want to say this from the get-go, that even within solid dispensationalists, they don't agree on every single thing, but there are some main things that they do agree on. See, I'm getting started early already. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> so this session is approaching the Synoptic Gospels from a dispensational perspective. Now, if you were in the first session, we looked at the foundation of dispensational method was interpreting God's word with a consistent literal approach. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we know that each one of us, especially those that are teaching, are called to rightly divide the word of truth. Father, we also know that we're called to preach the word, all of it. We know that all scripture is given by inspiration from you and is profitable. Father, help us to always be Bereans and to constantly study the Word of God to see if these things are so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now when I say we approach the Scripture literally, that does not mean that we ignore figures of speech. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. We I talked about this in the first session. Jesus go, goes about roaring as a what? A lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we understand that there are figures of speech, similes, and things like that. But even with that said, I believe that there's a literal understanding to be had. In fact, Pastor Brown in the first session was talking about the full armor of God. And there's clearly a literal explanation for each part of the armor that we have. We talked about a consistent little interpretation and acknowledging that God says what he means and he means what he says. It's very simplistic, but I believe that's true. We always have to understand the, the context, fully understand the context. I, I believe we always have to ask all the observation questions. The only time that's an exemption is if you know a passage so well you can stop asking. But I would suggest that you never stop asking all the who, what, where, why, when, and how. Always understand the historical setting of any given passage. And we talked about this in the first session, but when we consistently acknowledge, when we consistently interpret the Word of God literally, there's some distinctions that we understand between the church and Israel. They are not the same. The church is not Israel. Israel is not the church. And this is very important as we approach the Synoptic Gospels. Another thing that we should understand, when we understand first that the church is not Israel, not all scripture has a primary application to the church. Now I just acknowledge that all scripture is profitable, but not all scripture has a primary application to the church. Nor does all scripture have a primary application to the nation of Israel. How do we apply the famous seed of Christ to Israel? How do we apply the rapture to the nation of Israel? Well, we don't. All scripture is given by instrument of God. It is profitable, but again, not every passage has a primary application. What do we do when we get to the book of Levit Leviticus? We find principles, and we apply every principle that we can find. But there are some things that we're not going to have a primary application. I want you to think about this. From Genesis chapter 12 verse 2 to Malachi chapter 4 verse 6 is largely about who? 
Say it. Jews, Israel. It, the nation of Israel. But then we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1, to Revelations chapter 4, verse 11. And who is that largely about? It's about the church. We can go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. Now we're into the New Testament again. Revelation 6, 1 to Revelation 20, verse 6. And who's in the focus in much of that? Say it. Say it out. Israel again. So we have to acknowledge the things that are going on. So then we get to the Synoptic Gospels. So who are these historical narratives about? Who are they about? And the question that we should answer regarding the Synoptic Gospels, are these Gospels largely about the nation of Israel or largely about the church? Come right in if you're coming in. We have, I don't know if they're coming or going. Yeah. We have two seats with your names on it, or one seat. Okay, there you go. So again, regarding this not the Gospels, who are these narratives about? Are they largely about the nation of Israel or largely about the church? Something to consider, and I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of this. During Jesus' three-and-a-half-year ministry, we see Jesus presenting himself as Messiah to who? Please please say it out loud. The Jews. That's how I teach. I, I'm, I'm looking for interaction. Okay? So he, he presents himself as Messiah to the nation of Israel. Jesus preaches the gospel of the kingdom to the nation of Israel. He offers the kingdom to the nation of Israel. And then Jesus postpones the kingdom and withdraws he doesn't want to go near Jerusalem until it's his time to be taken. And then we have Jesus teaching about the 70th week of Daniel in the Olivet Discourse. Now we're about 45 days from the Ascension. Does that make a difference? I think it does. We also have Jesus teaching about the church age in the Upper Room Discourse. We're 43 days before the Ascension. Does that make a difference? I think it does. Why is it important? Because if we're understanding what's happening in the Synoptic Gospels, some of the information is progressive. We'll talk about this more tomorrow in my last session dealing with prophecy, but did the nation of Israel understand the postponement? No. I could ask this question, uh, should they have known once Jesus came should they have known I think they should because and I'm not going to get into that but one of the things that I've always been intrigued about what about the 70th week of Daniel <laughs> they had that prophecy didn't they expect that that had to take place so when we interpret the synoptic gospels consistently and contextually I, I believe it reveals to us that these Gospels are largely about the nation of Israel. I just want to say this before I go any further, before anybody wants to grab one of those weapons of destruction that Pastor <clears throat> Brown has out there and harpoon me with this. I love preaching from the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't know of any other scripture that moves people so much as speaking and preaching about the life of Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. But we're talking about how we apply and what's actually going on. So, when I look at these synoptic Gospels, I see the Jewish nature is quite obvious. And I think it's a, an error to ignore the Jewish nature of these synoptic Gospels. If we miss the fact that Jesus is offering himself as the Messiah to the nation of Israel, is that going to be a problem? I believe it is. He's offering himself in order to establish the earthly kingdom. Now, I want you to ponder this for a moment. Turn your Bibles to Acts. Acts chapter 1. Some of you probably know exactly where I'm going already with this. Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> We get to Acts chapter 1, and by this time, in Acts 1, 6, the disciples had been with Jesus for three and a half years. 
and that includes the 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, what's on the mind of the disciples at that time? Look at verse 6. Therefore, when they come together, they ask him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Three and a half years being discipled with by Christ, ministering with him, learning of all of his teaching during that time, what's on the mind of the disciples? Say it. The kingdom. That's on their mind. It's also important to note what they're not asking about. What didn't they ask about? Say it. They didn't ask about the church. The church is something that's going to be revealed. We're going to see a transition period through the book of Acts where in the beginning, I think that they're thinking it's all about the Jews still. We get to Acts chapter 10. Remember what happens in Joppa? Peter has the vision. And he, he got the vision one time. He said, I understand what you're saying, Lord. No, it was three times it had to be repeated to him. There was a change that was going to take place in the church. The Apostle Paul reveals later in, in Ephesians chapter 3 that the church was a mystery, not formally understood. So, they're thinking about the kingdom. Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 3. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. It says, To whom also he, referring to Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. This is the earthly kingdom. What was Jesus focusing on for forty days? He's focusing on the kingdom. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are historical narratives with really little to no commentary compared to John. So, if we approach the Synoptic Gospels, understanding their narratives, all we have to do is look at the plain sense of the Scriptures that are right in front of us. And be careful not to read in. We should always ask all the who, what, where, and why, but when it comes to the Synoptic Gospels, we need to make sure we're always answering the who. In the first session, we talked about observing distinctions that are seen with a literal approach to Scripture. And within dispensationalism, this is a, a huge difference between that and other hermeneutics, other ways that people approach the Word of God. We learned in the first session there are some that believe that the church replaced Israel. That is not true. Their church will never be Israel, and Israel will never be the church. But one of the first distinctions is pretty obvious and it's not the Gospels, is Jesus' target audience. In your handout, you look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Matthew 10, verse 5. These twelve, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That sounds pretty restrictive. Now, I realize that Jesus did have contact with Samaritans and Gentiles, and some of them came to saving faith. But the question is, regarding this not the Gospels, what is his major focus? Who is his major focus on? Israel. Thank you. Thank you. It's on Israel. Look down at Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I was not sent, wait a minute, who sent Jesus? Say it. God the Father. Is he saying, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Is he saying that's what God the Father did? God the Father sent him? Yes. So we see a, a pretty clear distinction as far as his target audience. Would it be, how many pastors here today? Raise your hands, please, so I can see you. Okay. Would it be appropriate for you guys to go home to your churches tomorrow, actually not tomorrow because that would be the Sabbath, on Sunday, I was, a day, I was a day off, would it be appropriate for you to go back to your churches and say, listen folks, I only want you to go and evangelize Jewish people, don't go near Gentiles or Samaritans. We wouldn't do that. But Jesus did do that. And Jesus told his disciples only to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Something different is going on here in the Synoptic Gospels. And appropriately so. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's in your handout. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. When did they become witnesses? Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. What happened? What needed to happen first before, in order for them to become witnesses? Think of a timeline. Jesus had to be raised from the dead first, because they were going to be witnesses of his death, burial, and resurrection. And yes, Acts chapter two, the day of Pentecost, they were waiting for the power on high in order for them to be witnesses. So he says, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What happened to the restrictions? They're gone. From the Synoptic Gospels to now, something has changed. We're only days before, they were focusing on what? The kingdom. But now, there's going to be a focus on the church age that will begin in Acts chapter 2. So we see this change in Acts chapter 2. A consistent little interpretation shows us that the people group being focused on is not the Gospels, is largely the nation of Israel. And the people group being focused on beginning in Acts, especially Acts chapter 2, is everybody. It begins with the Jews, but it keeps going to the rest of the world. And praise the Lord for that. I always get knee-jerk reactions when I get into this next section, but I'm going anyway. <laughs> you know why? Because it's the Word of God. I'm not afraid. Okay? What about the message during Jesus' earthly ministry? What was he preaching? Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And also... Mark chapter 1, 15, in saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom. What is it? Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Okay. The gospel of the kingdom. What is it? What's the good news? This is a nationalistic message. Remember, it's isolated to the nation of Israel, right? I, okay, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's focusing on the nation of Israel, promising an earthly kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom message says the kingdom is near. So if the kingdom is near, that would imply what? That the king is near. Was he? Yes, he's on earth. In this kingdom message for Israel, it should have provoked them to ponder a lot of prophecies. Can you think of any? Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Zechariah, just to mention a few, right? They should have wondered about this message, the kingdom message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, this is a nationalistic message to the nation of Israel, but one of the reasons why the message is so short, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The nation of Israel already had a context for this, didn't they? What was the context? The whole Old Testament scriptures. Should they have known they needed to repent? Let me give you a giant hint. and uh, This is like the ele theological elephant to the room. I've taught on this before and had weeks. I only have 50 minutes. But one of the theological elephants in the room is the fact there's blindness in Israel at that time, according to Isaiah's prophecy. Okay. Some of the things that you would think that they should have understood, the fact that they were occupied by the Romans, did that say anything to them? According to Deuteronomy 28, if they had obeyed all the statutes and all the commandments of God, where would they be? They wouldn't be with the Roman Empire over them, but that's not where they were. They needed to repent. They had a lot of things that they should have repented of, and they had the Old Testament scriptures as their context and background to that message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They should have been able to fully comprehend what that meant. Do you remember when John the Baptist was in prison? 
And I'm not sure exactly what was going on with John, but he seemed to be wondering. I'm hearing about all these miracles that this man is doing. He was the forerunner of Jesus. And I don't know if he was depressed. Or, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what's going on. But he sends disciples, his disciples, to Jesus to ask him. I'm going to paraphrase. Are you the coming one? Or what? Do we seek another? Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples, John the Baptist's disciples? He said, go back to them. You have it right in your notes in Matthew chapter 11, verse 5. Go back to them and tell them this. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. This was all happening in the presence of the nation of Israel. Where did Jesus get that from? How about Isaiah's prophecy? So again, when they hear that message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus doing all these miracles, all they had to do is reflect on former prophecies and realize something is going on here and we need to do something about it. And the thing they needed to do was repent. But there were conditions. In addition to repenting, they had to believe that Jesus was who? Messiah. What are some of the specific things that he is the Christ, the Son of God? Thank you, the Son of the Living God. We see that in Peter's confession. But the majority of the people in Israel at the time, that time did not believe Jesus was Messiah. I mean, if you study this, not the Gospels, they were plotting. Some of them were plotting to kill him early on in Jesus' ministry. And that plot just kept going and going and building and building until it got to the point that they did kill him. But that was their plot. Listen to John chapter 8, verse 24. Therefore I said unto you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, what does that mean, believe, in, believe that he's he? All the things that Jesus claimed to be, that he's God before Abraham was, he, he, he was, that he's the Son of God, that he's the Messiah, all those things. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The focus was on believing in the very person, the identity of Jesus Christ, as he not only said to people who he was, but also as he manifested who he was by the signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, regarding the Gospel, this is usually where I get some knee-jerk reactions, but again, I'm not afraid because I'm going to give you the scripture. What did the disciples understand about the death, burial, and resurrection for nearly the first three years of Jesus' earthly ministry? Okay. They expected it as a tragedy every time he spoke of it. Mm -hmm. Other than that. We're way ahead of the game here already. <laughs> okay, let's go, let's go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you answer the question after we looked at some verses, all right? And the reason we're doing this is to fully understand distinctions between the Synoptic Gospels and the Epistles, distinctions between the Lord's earthly ministry for three and a half years and the church age ministry. John chapter 2, verse 19. John chapter 2, verse 19. It's in your notes. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? What did the disciples understand at that moment? Well, this is John's Gospel, and John gives a lot of commentary. And the first two verses that we just read, 19 and 20, that's basically the historical narrative with no commentary. But the next two verses, 21 and 22, John gives commentary. And I believe this is after the fact. Well, he wrote this gospel. This is one of the latest gospels into the 90s at least, A.D. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, what's the next word? When. When he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, 
and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. What do you notice? It's when they understood. After the resurrection. Now remember, we're trying to answer the question as to what the disciples understood. Another thing to remember, if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. John chapter 14, verse 26. This is the upper room discourse. This is about 43 days before the ascension. He is speaking to his disciples about church age things, although they don't fully comprehend that. But one of the things he said about the Holy Spirit is when he would come, he would teach them and remind them. Remind them of things that they didn't fully comprehend. I'm actually doing a study right now of all the things in the Gospels that they were told but they didn't understand until after the resurrection. It's pretty interesting. The next thing we're going to do here, we're going to look at Peter's statements, some of Peter's statements about his understanding. We're going to look at them in chronological order to reveal what Peter understood. What did Peter understand? The first one is John chapter 6, verse 68. In the context here, some of the disciples were leaving Jesus. Not the twelve, but some of the disciples, from his teaching, they had stopped following him. And Jesus says to his disciples, Will you also go away? I love Peter. Because I think he's like most of us. In John 6, 68, this is what happens. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Does that sound like a perfect confession of faith to you? You know why? Because it is. It is a perfect confession of faith. Peter is a believer. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But then we get to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. In the context, Jesus had come to his disciples and he had asked a question. And this is in reference to the general populace in the nation of Israel. Whom do men say that I am? Do you remember the answers? There's three answers. What are they? Your, what's one of the answers? Your Elijah, Elijah your John the Baptist, your that prophet. Okay? What answer was missing? That Jesus, the general populace was not saying that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. But once again, dear Peter steps forward in Matthew 6, 16, after Jesus turns to his disciples and says, but whom do you say that I am? And Jesus says, I mean, and Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What's Peter's spiritual condition at this point? Say it. Believer. He's a believer. Crystal clear. Crystal clear is a believer. But then we get to Matthew 16, 21. Nothing's changed in his spiritual state. He's still a believer. Matthew 16, 21, from that time forth began, I believe this, this is when Jesus began, and this is also privately, he began to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him and saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. This is just over six months before the crucifixion. <clears throat> what do you notice about Peter's understanding? He's not believing in the death, not believing in the resurrection, not right now, not at that point. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 9. Now this is as they're coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And again, this is not even all the disciples, but this is privately. As they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And note the response. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising of the dead should mean. 
Now, some of these men might have been fishermen, but I believe it was typical for boys in Israel to start their training in the scriptures at age six, a lot of them. Do you think that these men didn't know about the resurrection? No. They weren't questioning the resurrection of the dead. If they were true believers, they were looking forward to that. What they were wondering about and questioning is the resurrection of their Messiah and the death of their Messiah. What did that mean? What's going on in the disciples' minds? We get down to Mark chapter 9, verse 31. It says, For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. Hmm. They didn't understand it and they were afraid to ask him. Now at the end of Jesus' withdrawal period, does everybody know what I mean by the withdrawal period? Matthew 13, from, from Matthew 11 and 12, we see a clear rejection by the nation of Israel to Jesus' Messiah. In Matthew 13, he begins to give the parables about the postponement period. That means the kingdom that was offered is now postponed until a future event, which is still, as premillennialists, still future. All right? But at this time, the withdrawal period is ending, and look what he says in Luke 8.31. Then he took the twelve aside. Again, this is privately. Every time we see this, he's taking them aside privately. And he said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and all things are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished, for he will be delivered <clears throat> to the Gentiles, will be mocked and insulted and spit upon, they will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Hmm. Again, in approaching the Synoptic Gospels, we're looking at distinctions between what's happening in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus' earthly ministry, and what happens as we get into the church age. What did these disciples understand and not understand at this time? When they were going out preaching the gospel of the kingdom, were these disciples preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? No. Well, there was a concept of the resurrection mm -hmm. in reference to what was it Mary or Martha told Jesus, yes, you'll raise him in the last day. Right. Absolutely. I believe in veiled ways a number of times Jesus does talk about his resurrection. But from the passage that we just read, the disciples weren't understanding it. In one case, it's hidden from them. And if they did think of that resurrection of, of the final day, then they were thinking somehow that final day would match with what else he was saying. Mm -hmm. was, yeah. Again, just to, just to quickly think about the context, I don't believe... J Jesus, in a veiled way, talked about his resurrection, but I believe this nationalistic message, repent for the kingdom of heaven, it was at hand because they already had the context of the whole Old Testament in background. They should have needed, they should have known what they needed to repent of, and they should have known by the signs and wonders and miracles that Jesus was doing that the Messiah was present. But what happens in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost? Good old Peter, he's the first one to preach, in my understanding. Does anybody know in that very short message when he preaches at the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, how many times he refers to the resurrection in that one message? How many times? I don't remember, but it's a lot. I think it's six times. So this same Peter, who was not preaching the death, burial, and resurrection, now he has the power from the Holy Spirit, and he has, he's a witness now, and now he's preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. Why is this important? Because when we're looking at the Synoptic Gospels, we're, we're making sure we see the distinction between what's happening in those Synoptic Gospels and what's happening in the church age. The first thing we see is the target audience is very restricted, the nation of Israel. The message is different. Same person but a different message. Now, in the first session, 
we talked about how, and I am a dispensationalist, and I don't believe that the church is underneath the Mosaic Law. I don't believe that. It was the nation of Israel that was given the Mosaic Law. And I believe once the New Covenant started, the church is no longer under the law, but I believe that old, that old law system has been done away with, according to the book of Hebrews. Now, this next section I'm going to get into, and I just want you to be Bereans, and you might already have your, your thoughts on this particular subject matter, but it has to do with the Sermon on the Mount. <gasps> He's not going there, is he? Yes, I am, because we're talking about distinctions between the Synoptic Gospels and the Church Age teachings. Should we preach on the Sermon on the Mount? Yes! Should we find principles from the Sermon on the Mount? Yes! Should we, should we be careful about distinctions that are not necessarily about the Church? No one's saying yes but me. Yes! Okay. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. Before we even go any further, was the nation of Israel during Jesus' earthly ministry under the law, Mosaic law? Yes. Yes. Can you think of any examples when that was manifested by Jesus himself? Remember the man who had the, the leprous hand? He was to show himself to the priest and offer the sacrifice required by Moses. Exactly. Jesus was telling him to keep the law. Remember the woman caught in adultery? We have no idea what Jesus was doodling in the sand, but he said something to those religious leaders. He that is without sin, do what? He didn't say you're not underneath the law anymore. You can't cast a stone. He said, he that's without sin can cast the first stone. And that's an important thing to remember. But over and over again, Jesus is abiding by the Mosaic Law. Matthew 5, beginning of verse 17. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot and one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot going on here in the Sermon on the Mount between Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I will tell you from my understanding, I believe there is a particular people group, a particular group of leaders that are in Jesus' crosshairs. Anybody want to take a guess at who they are? Pastor Brown? Scribes and Pharisees. I mean, he has zeroed in on those guys, and, and he's pulling the trigger. And he's he's confronting, about, confronting them in this sermon, whether they're there or not, about their improper teaching of the law. What was missing in the scribes and the Pharisees? They were certainly trying to have the letter of the law, although they were hypocrites because they had all kinds of loopholes for themselves. But what about the spirit of the law? According to the Old Testament, how were they to love God? All Anybody? With, their heart, soul, and mind. with all their heart, soul, and mind. And strength. And strength, yes. Does that describe the scribes and Pharisees? No. It doesn't describe many of the religious leaders in Israel at the time. So Jesus is confronting, but one of the things that's clear here, I believe he's referring to the Mosaic Law. Whoever breaks one and teaches one, it doesn't teach all of them. This goes back to Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. To observe, to do all. So, if we, if we say that the church is distinct from Israel, 
and the church is not Israel, and I believe they're not the same. And we also understand that it was Israel that had the Mosaic Covenant, not the Mosaic, yes, the Mosaic Covenant with the Mosaic Law. They were given to the nation of Israel, but they're not for the church. Then how do we, how do we approach the Sermon on the Mount? Carefully. We're not under the law. I'm going to tell you how I would deal with this. I am a dispensationalist, and I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. Whenever I'm teaching, it doesn't matter where I am in the scripture, I want to deal with the context. I want to deal with the original audience. I want to deal with the distinction if this is talking about Israel or the church. And I want to deal with all that, all those interpretations, and then I'll get to the application. Can you see why I do that? Because if the church is not under the law and I get to the Sermon on the Mount, I have a problem if I'm saying, if one of you breaks this. You see where I'm going with this? And I'm just going to throw this out. I have heard, and I'm not saying you can't, you should preach all of God's word, but the beam of the mote in your eye and the, and, the, and the person who has the splinter, right? I believe in the context, Jesus is focusing that on the scribes and Pharisees in context. We're done at what time? Ten up. Ten up, okay. But it's supper. Is that? But it's a supper hour, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty hungry. I think, <laughs> I'll think I'll be on time. I think I'll be on time. Just a few verses. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. They're in your notes. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be tangled again with the yoke of bondage. What could that possibly mean? Well, the contest is going to tell us. Indeed, I, Paul, say unto you that if you become circumcised, well, why would someone do that? A requirement of the Mosaic Law. Christ will, be pro Christ will profit you nothing, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he has become a debtor to keep what? The whole law. So I know that there are some today, like some Reformed and some Covenant theologians that will say, the church is under the law, but we're not underneath the civil or ceremonial law. The problem with that is that's not how it was taught in the Old Testament. It was a unit. It was indivisible. Right? What does James 2.10 say? You had it before, Justin. <laughs> Come on. Uh, let's see. Um... Well, if you, you keep the law, you break them all. Is what <laughs> <laughs> it's late. Pastor Brown is giving you the thumbs up. He accepts that as an answer at this late hour. I like it. Because it's indivisible. We can't pick and choose. <clears throat> Years ago, I was at my dentist's office, and he, you know how they crank you back? And my dentist is kind of funny. He has, he'll have these posters on the ceiling because he knows eventually you're going to be looking at that poster. And I don't think that my dentist in Wokebro is a believer but he had all these little sayings in these little boxes on this big giant poster. And one of them said, the law, and had a Bible beside it, the law is not multiple choice. And I went, huh, my dentist is smarter than he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the church is not under the law, so if we're not under the law, we need to be careful what we do with us not the Gospels. Because they were under the law. Preach it, understand it, but do it contextually. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. To which I say, Amen. I want to close with just a few thoughts about distinctions that we see in this not the Gospels. Who was Jesus focused on? The nation of Israel. What or who was the gospel of the kingdom focused on? The nation of Israel. Through most of the disciples' time with Jesus, what was their understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection? They didn't really comprehend it. But praise the Lord at the day of Pentecost they did. Why does this matter? 
Regarding the Synoptic Gospels, why does this matter? Because it's important for us to understand exactly what's going on, understand the context, understand what's going on with Jesus' earthly ministry, understand the Jewish nature of the Synoptic Gospels, and then from there, interpret. Clarifies. Excuse me? It clarifies some things that others would look at and say, this is a contradiction. That's true. I believe that a literal interpretation, a consistent literal interpretation, often does that. It clarifies things that some people will get confused about, but when you look at it literally and contextually, all of a sudden it gets cleared up. Why does a consistent literal approach, why is it so important to recognize the Jewish nature of Synoptic Gospels? I'm going to give you something to think about. A correct interpretation will lead to a correct application. But an incorrect interpretation will lead to what? An incorrect application. I don't know my audience here, and there's something I want to ask. You can harpoon me later. I believe in God's free grace. I don't believe in Lordship salvation. I don't believe that. But I'm convinced that that Lordship salvation comes from not understanding it's not the Gospels properly. Because they're taking things that Jesus said to his disciples during his earthly, earthly ministry to the nation of Israel and Jewish people and applying it to the church. And I think we need to be careful about that. There are things that are unique to the nation of Israel. I talked about this in the first session. We have, the church has, a unique rapture. A unique rapture. A unique, unique resurrection, which is the rapture. Who's involved in that? Church, age, saints only. Israel has a resurrection. It's different than ours. Still a blessing, right? Who is the bride of Christ? I believe it's the church. We have a unique privilege. Does Israel have a unique privilege forever and ever? Yes, they do. I am convinced according to the Gospels, and Jesus, I talked about this at the end, my, my first session, that Jesus promised his disciples that in the future kingdom, his Jewish disciples would reign over the twelve tribes of Israel. I take that literally, that there'll be Jewish men that serve God in a faithful way, and they were apostles, and his apostles, that they will literally reign over the twelve tribes. I'm not sure how it works with this little tribe of Levites, but you know what I'm saying. And that would also mean that these tribes more than likely will have their original land allotment plus, because they've never had the full amount of land that was promised to them. Right? 